here is the uh, list of the uh, top 50 highest grossing movies of all time. Okay. And what's fascinating about this list is that of the 50 titles here, only one is R-rated. The vast bulk of these titles, as you look through the list, the top 50 are either PG or G. Uh, That's a surprisingly positive statistic. <laughs> what does that tell us about the audience uh, in, around the world? The, the, the market, the audience is telling us we don't want R-rated product. Yeah. We want product that is G and PG, sometimes PG-13. But when you would think that so many people would say, no, 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 audiences want, uh, you know, sexual content, swearing, violence, etc. But these numbers don't support that. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Saints Unscripted. This is a very special episode today because we have with us a very special guest from Ontario, Canada, no less. We'd like you to meet Richard Boddington. He is a Canadian filmmaker. He's a International Emmy Award nominee. He's an International Family Film Festival Award nominee and a Rhode Island International Film Festival winner. So let's get into this. Hi, Richard. Hi, how are you doing, Taylor? I'm, I'm doing great. Great. Uh, it's great to have you on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so why don't you to introduce yourself? I think you're, so you're from, you're coming to us live from Ontario, right? That's right. Yeah. I'm originally from the United Kingdom. Okay. And uh, so I'm a, du a dual, dual citizen and uh, moved to Canada as a child, did part of my schooling between Canada and, uh, and the UK. And uh, when I finished high school, I went to BYU to uh, pursue my uh, film career because BYU had a, had a film program. Uh, right. Did one year doing that, left for two years uh, on my mission, which was in northern New Zealand. Uh, came back, continued with BYU, finished in 1990, and then uh, immediately was hired by uh, CTV Network in Toronto. And CTV is the equivalent of ABC or CBS uh, in the okay. United States. So I started working there as a producer, was there for five years, uh, left in 2000 to start my own uh, business. And in about 2006, 2007, I started making feature films and just haven't stopped since. In fact, uh, my uh, sixth feature film was just released on March 23rd in the United States by Lionsgate. Uh, that awesome. one is called uh, Hero Dog, The Journey Home. And uh, currently in prep on feature film number seven. That is so cool. Um, I'm actually in the film program at BYU. Oh, uh, it's not too late to quit and choose a real career like accounting, you know. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. But it wouldn't be nearly as fun. No, it wouldn't. So <laughs> how did you get involved in filmmaking? Like what was what was it that sparked your interest? Well, in 1982, I was 12 years old. I went to see a movie called E.T. Oh, yes. In, uh, <laughs> In the little town of Orangeville, Ontario, I came out of the theater, had an epiphany. I said, that's it. I must be a filmmaker. Wow. And uh, from that moment on, I just, you know, relentlessly pursued it and never looked back. Uh, if you had asked me at 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, what I was going to be when I finished school, I would have said film director. Um, so there was nothing that was going to deter me from that course. And so that's all I, that's all I pursued all through high school. Uh, I pursued making uh, movies on Super 8, entering them into, in, into festivals uh, and things like that. So that was back in the days when you had to actually work and earn money to buy film and you yeah. actually cut film, uh, you know, on a little moviola in your room because uh, digital and digital editing was many years away from existing, especially for student filmmakers. Yeah. So that was, that was how I got started. I, you know, Steven Spielberg uh, got me into the movie industry, along with, I'm sure, thousands of other people uh, around the globe as well. Oh my gosh, yeah. He's a huge inspiration for a lot of them, I'm sure. Um, what's funny is like, I, I can, I'm looking at the, the, the films that you've made and I don't see any alien films. E.T. was your inspiration, but no, no sci-fi, no aliens? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I like that uh, genre, but uh, no, it's not, uh, not a genre that I've, uh, you know, pursued yet. 
Um, I am working right now, uh, finished a screenplay and out to cast for a large budget Richard the Lionheart feature film. Uh, and that will cool. be my sort of first departure from uh, the, the specifically targeted family genre. This will probably be a PG-13 movie because it has battle scenes uh, in it. Yeah, um, Richard but that, uh, that is a film that I'm uh, actively pursuing right now. We're currently out to cast. So I just can't mention what cast we're, we're, we're pursuing right now until they're attached. Uh, in the meantime, I'm shooting a new film starting in, in September, which is another family-orientated uh, movie. Cool. So you, uh, you'd like to dwell on the, the family-oriented and animal-themed, it looks like, sort of films. Well, I sort of fell into the, uh, the live-action uh, animal genre. Uh-huh. It was very successful for me. It was very successful uh, internationally. It was very successful in, in the United States. Uh, the first Against the Wild uh, you know, sold hundreds of thousands of DVDs uh, at Walmart. Uh, they had it for a one month exclusive. They ended up renewing it 12 times. Um, wow. It's been translated into I don't know how many different languages aired all over the globe. Uh, in January 12th, uh, HBO Max aired three of my movies on the same day, Against the Wild, Against the Wild 2, and, and An Elephant's Journey. They all premiered at the, at the same time. So the great thing about the family genre is it really is what we call an evergreen. Uh, every couple of years, there's a new batch of kids coming up who are going to watch that movie. True. Uh, Walt Disney discovered this back in the 60s. Uh, his, his math was that every seven years, there was a new generation of kids, and they could take their animated titles and release them every seven years to a whole new audience that hadn't seen them before. Hmm. Uh, so Against the Wild was released in 2013, but it's going as strong now as it was in 2013. Uh, it's a, you know through Amazon Prime, through iTunes. Uh, it just continues to be viewed and sold to television and DVD. Uh, same with the other titles that have followed after it. And I just discovered that it was a genre that mainstream filmmakers had abandoned. Nobody wanted to do live action movies with, with kids and with animals uh, combined. Yeah. And I've had a wonderful time. Doing, I think I've used just about every kind of animal imaginable in my movies between the uh, Africanized and North American uh, versions of my movies and had a wonderful time, uh, you know, doing it. And the great thing is, is that uh, when you're shooting everything uh, live and using real animals, you know, the, the grizzly bear in Against the Wild is going to look as good in 2013 as he will in 2050. Yeah, because it's a real bear. Uh, a, 20, a, a 2013 computer-generated bear is not going to look very good in 2050. Mm -hmm. uh, computer-generated material simply doesn't age that well. As people look back on movies with heavy computer-generated work in it that were made 10 years ago, now even lay members of the audience start to realize, hey, that CG is not holding up Yeah, as well. So uh, I found it to be a, a really fun way to make a movie. And, uh, you know, there's always been lots of enthusiasm from cast to appear in movies that use nothing but uh, live animals. And like I say, if I, I, I do tell people that I am a commercial filmmaker. Uh, my movies don't go to festivals. Uh, well, on, on rare occasion, they go. Uh, to festivals if, if there's a specific need, but I'm not making movies for that crowd. My wife insists that I bring home a paycheck. Um, <laughs> so I do uh, make commercially viable movies. Cool. And I'm not saying anything negative about people that make, you know, non-commercial uh, movies. It's just, it's just not a genre that I've pursued or that I have an interest in, uh, in making. Uh, you know, there are, if you, if you look at the reviews online of my movies, there's plenty of critics that will say, well, this is all about, you know, these, these children and the beautiful scenery and these animals and blah, blah, blah. I say, well, yeah, I mean, that's because that's what, uh, you know, audiences enjoy watching. And uh, I have to uh, provide a commercial success to distributors like Lionsgate uh, who are looking to realize a, a profit on their investment like any Hollywood studio would. Right. Now, interestingly enough, as I was getting prepared for this interview, here is the uh, list of the uh, top 50 highest grossing movies of all time. Okay. And what's fascinating about this list is that of the 50 titles here, only one is R-rated. Just one out of 50. And that was the uh, Joker, uh, which came in at number 31. Uh, the other interesting thing about this list is that there are 15 family titles on this list movies that were specifically designed uh, to be g-rated family 
oriented product. There's 15 on here. Two of those are in the top 10 right now. Uh, we have Lion King sitting at number seven and uh, number 10, Frozen 3. Uh, so the rest are primarily, uh, you know, you've got uh, James Cameron, who's also from Ontario, by the way. Uh, he has the number one and number three uh, titles in Avatar and Titanic. Uh, the rest are a lot of Star Wars and superhero product. Uh, but the sense. highest uh, rating on any of these outside of Joker is our, our PG-13 rated titles. The vast bulk of these titles, as you look to the list, the top 50, are either PG or G. Uh, That's a surprisingly positive statistic. <laughs> what does that tell us about the audience uh, in, around the world? The, the, the market, the audience is telling us we don't want R-rated product. Yeah. We want product that is G and PG, sometimes PG-13. But when you would think that so many people would say, no, 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 audiences want uh, you know, sexual content, swearing, violence, etc. But these numbers don't support that. The numbers are saying audiences don't want that. They want material that everyone can view. It only makes mathematical sense from a, from a commercial business point of view that you want to make a movie that's going to appeal to the largest sector of the audience possible. And if you make an R-rated movie, you've already cut off people ages 1 to 18. They're not going to be able point. to go, and their parents aren't going to take them. Uh, so that just doesn't make a lot of sense to focus your, you know, your, your commercial pursuits on movies with that, with that rating. The data simply doesn't support it, that that is where, the, where, where, where you should be. Huh. That's crazy. Cause it's almost like the, the attitude, especially with aspiring film students is that the, the film industry is kind of a, an edgy, like a faith hostile environment. Uh, and that a lot of filmmakers have to sacrifice their principles or sacrifice even like their own beliefs in order to be successful. Uh, but from the numbers, it doesn't sound like that's necessarily true. Have you seen any of that or have you felt any of those kind of sentiments in your experience? Well, I, uh, I have been told, you know, numerous times by distributors when I've been pitching movies, uh, no, Richard, we want R-rated products. And I've immediately pushed back and said, well, you know, I'll be very straight with you. You know, here's a sales report uh, from one of my last films. And, you know, what movies are you carrying right now that can put up these kind of numbers? And they're very, un, you know, they have to admit that, yes, they do not have titles that can beat, uh, you know, those kind of numbers. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I've done four deliveries now in a row to Lionsgate. Lionsgate is not exactly, you know, it isn't known as a family uh, studio per se, uh, but they recognize that there is a very large sector of the audience that wishes to watch this kind of content. And when distributors say to me, well, you know, we put out this family title or, you know, we, we don't have families watching our product. I say, well, look at your titles. If 90% of your product line is horror films, what do you expect? Obviously families are not going to tune in to watch that. You have to give family audiences something to watch um you know that the, they're going to appreciate uh i say i say i'm making a movie that the the, the audience is is two to 102 doesn't matter the age group uh, in, in the industry we have a term called co-viewing and co-viewing means that uh, parents kids and extended family will all watch the same movie together uh on a on a friday night um, movie night or pizza night and there's just there are thousands hundreds of thousands of families all across the united states that have dedicated family movie nights now. Uh, it's become very much a tradition all across the United States, cuts across all uh, races, all demographics. It's just something that many Americans enjoy doing now. And if the product is not there for them to watch, then what are they going to, you know, what are they gonna, what are they gonna do? Right. So I think that, uh, I think that there are a lot of aspiring filmmakers in their, in their 20s who are gonna say, well, I don't really want to make any family product because I can't really relate to that. Or like, as you say, it's not edgy enough. I won't get into South by Southwest. I certainly won't get into Sundance because Sundance will not program a family film. Uh, so, you know, there's, I've found that, uh, you know, that I'm just going to take the process of skipping all that and work with uh, the commercial buyers and distributors i'd like to say i work closely with lionsgate i work closely with major distributors in the in in europe 
uh, which are the two primary areas that finance uh, these uh, these movies. And uh, you know, I'm just going just to keep making them. It's uh, you know, it, it just makes good business sense. Yeah, that and that's that's awesome. You've obviously been able to to do really well with this. Uh, for a lot of filmmakers, there's like this fear that uh, that it, you have to sacrifice time with like family and you have to make a lot of like, you know, personal life sacrifices in order to be successful in the industry, um, which makes it difficult as a Latter-day Saint, especially because, you know, your faith, you're so involved with, you know, with church things and with family things. Um, how have you been able to, to find balance with those two things? Well, unfortunately, there is an old saying on movie sets. There's only two kinds of people, single people and divorced people. Uh, that is a saying on movie sets. That's so sad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you often do find that because the hours are brutal. Think about a job where you work five to six days a week and you work 12 to 16 hour days and then you go back and you do it again. Uh, the hours in film are long and everyone is expected to work long hours. Uh, nobody can expect that you're always going to get Sunday off, although on unionized shoots, it's pretty, un pretty uncommon to work on Sunday because the producer is going to be paying horrendous uh, overtime and penalties to have the crew working on Sunday. So I've never actually had a crew uh, work on Sunday. Saturday, yes. Uh, the other thing that pe people, you know, especially, you know, uh, in our faith need to understand is that in film, you are a freelancer. You are not going to finish school and then go and get a nine to five job with benefits uh, and get a paycheck every two weeks. That's not how the film right. industry works. Every single person that you see on a film set is a freelancer. They're there for the duration of the shoot. And when the shoot's over, they'll be unemployed. Then they have to hop on to a different movie. Now, some people love this lifestyle. They love the fact that they work. They make very good money. Uh, then they have two months off to say, go traveling. Uh, and then they start a new project as opposed to being locked into a job where you only have two weeks off a year. So there are some benefits for the people that enjoy this kind of uh, lifestyle. I tell all up and coming uh, film students that expect 10 years out of school to establish your career to the point where you're always getting called and working frequently. That's about how long it's going to take and expect to be away from home. Uh, for, you know, long periods of time. So it's very similar times to people that have careers in the Navy when they get deployed overseas uh, and they're gone for long periods of time and come back. And this is the reality of our industry. It's a tough, tough, tough industry to be in. Very tough. And I was very fortunate in high school that I had a film teacher. We actually had a film program in our high school, which is quite unusual. And, uh, that teacher always said, look, Richard, you're doing this because you love it, not because you want to make money at it. You pursue it out of love. Right. Film has to be something that you pursue out of love. Otherwise, don't do it. You're, you're causing yourself to have a horrible life and your family as well. It takes me on average anywhere from a year to 18 months to pull the financing together for a new movie. Uh, and then, you know, it's all over in two months, the whole shoot, the prep, everything. Uh, then into post and now we're on to the next thing. And now here are just some interesting statistics, okay? okay? It took Steven Spielberg 10 years to get Lincoln made. It took Richard Attenborough 20 years to get Gandhi into production. 20 years. It took Barbara Streisand 15 years to get Yentl into production. What people don't see is the incredible number of years and toil and sacrifice that the primary creators behind those movies had to put in to get them made. Hmm. That is crazy. And <laughs> it's, it's funny because the more you talk about it, the, the less fun it sounds, but it's still like something, like you said, like you have to love filmmaking. You have to, to love it in order to, to be willing to make those kinds of sacrifices. It's extremely difficult. Um, well, as the old saying goes, Taylor, there's no business like show business. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've certainly loved it. I've loved every minute of it. I love being on set. And, uh, you know, I'm also the writer of my movies, uh, also the editor. So I have complete creative control over what I'm putting on screen. Uh, I'm only doing it to please one person, which is myself. And then I invite the audience to, you know, like it or to enjoy it or not enjoy it. And sometimes people don't. 
um, that's the way it goes when you when you're creating a, a creative product. The fact is, some people won't like it. I'm sure there are people that came into the Sistine Chapel when Michelangelo was done and said, "No, I don't like it." And they walked out. So that's just the way it goes when you're creating, uh, you know, anything creative that you are sharing with an audience. Right. So um, if you don't mind me asking, with all of this and with uh, your evident success, uh, what role has your faith or spirituality played in your filmmaking career? Because I almost feel like you have to have some kind of faith, some element of faith in order to even go into it in the first place. Like that's a big risk. You've got to have some sort of assurance that this is going to work out, right? Well, uh, I think that, you know, one of the things that I found incredibly helpful for a career in film was serving a full-time mission. And uh, it's amazing how many of those skills just naturally translated into, uh, you know, working in film, just the very basic concepts of, you know, getting up early every day, working long hours, uh, fighting exhaustion, and then getting and doing it all over again, and just being determined to complete a goal, learning how to lead others. Um, You know, if you're going to be a director, you are, you know, the leader of a, on my films, I usually average about a crew, about 75 people. It's a lot of people for you to be uh, managing and being responsible for. Uh, I'm sort of famous in the, in, in the Southern Ontario film community for my no swearing rule on set. We also have a pre-production meeting. I tell all the department heads, I say, please inform your, your staff that there's, we have no swearing rule on set, uh, especially since we have, uh, you know, children, uh, on set in most scenes for starters uh, we have you know uh, movie sets now are about 50 50 in a, in a gender split it's very unbecoming of men to be using any sort of uh, foul language around uh, having ladies on set so people always ask me, well are you serious Richard do you mean that I say yeah I'm serious there's no swearing on set it's just a very simple rule there's no swearing on set uh, every now and again, I'll be walking across a set and a crew member will just randomly stop and say, I heard you're a Mormon. And I'll say, yeah, that's true. Say, oh, that's interesting. And that's it. But it's funny how somehow that information gets out uh, on set. Of course, being the director, I have the and the producer, the uh, advantage that I know that uh, nothing negative is going to happen to me if somebody finds out about my faith and doesn't like members of the church. Right. Uh, I can't, it's not like I can be fired. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, it's a, it's a tough business, but, uh, I've always found that I've never, I've never, ever experienced a, uh, an incidence where my church membership was in any way an impediment to succeeding in film. Uh, I've always found it to be an advantage in terms of, uh, you know, if we look at all of the accusations that are being made against men everywhere now, uh, in the entertainment industry, the church from the time that I was a youth, was teaching young men how to act and behave around the young women, how, and then elders quorum, constantly t- instructing men on how to act and behave around women. Yeah. Long before any of the unions or any, anyone in the media decided we should come up with some you know, guidelines or set rules uh, to try and influence men to behave better. And unfortunately, 99.9% of the time, it is men who behave inappropriately. Um, so that was, you know, just some built-in training from the church that I had at an, at, a, at an early age. You know, when I was in South Africa, every night I'd be having uh, dinner in a restaurant with Elizabeth Hurley without my wife there. And, uh, you know, we had a wonderful time. But, and, you know, it, two people can have this, uh, a very nice sit down, even though they're not married. We're, we're in a public place. We're just, we're having dinner. And, uh, you know, we go back to our individual hotels. So, you know, all, all this sort of stuff that should be common sense, you would think. Early on in the church, I was being taught, you know, these are ways that you can pr- protect yourself from being, you know, accused of doing something uh, inappropriate. And if you follow these guidelines, no one's ever going to say anything negative. That's really cool. It's good to hear. I also think about, just quickly, about uh, the high incidences of alcohol and drug use in the film industry, uh, yeah. which is just epidemic uh, amongst crew and amongst actors. And uh, of course, the church has a built-in way of helping people to ensure they don't get involved in, in alcohol, become alcoholics. Uh, so it's never been an issue for me. Um, I've had so many crew members talk about how, you know, the director was showing up three sheets to the wind every morning uh, and how that affected the entire shoot. 
So somebody may not like my writing, they may not like my directing, but nobody can say I ever showed up on set, uh, you know, under <laughs> the influence of alcohol. So right. it's just, just a lot of very pragmatic things that growing up with a church background has been helpful uh, in the film industry. <laughs> well, that is awesome. That's, that's, a, that's a good thing to hear because it's usually stigmatized as the opposite. Do you have any last little nuggets of wisdom to give for aspiring LDS filmmakers? Yeah, I mean, I would uh, uh, tell, you know, everybody who's, let's say, up and coming, just, uh, you know, reemphasize what I was saying earlier about being prepared to basically do battle with a, with a tough industry, uh, but also an industry that is more and more and more welcoming to people with uh, content ideas that will be appropriate for all audiences. Uh, the number of jobs available right now in the film industry has never been higher. And the reason for that is because there's never been more platforms. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, we never could have foreseen the absolute monstrous generator of fresh content that Netflix would become. Right. Uh, and there are so many streaming platforms now looking for content that did not exist earlier. And so many of them are very well funded and can you know produce can put together a very nice budget even byu tv is producing original content uh of, of very significant uh budgets which didn't happen when i was there in the 90s what we did in the 90s was we, we made a newscast and that was it i, I would say also to up and coming uh latter-day saint filmmakers please don't think that you can use your faith to change the movie industry or change the world uh you know you you're going to put out uh good product that people will be drawn to. But at the end of the day, it is still uh, an entertainment piece if it's gonna be successful. The church has an entire department that puts out product that is geared toward a faith message, uh, which of course we would expect the church to do. That's completely within their purview. But I think that Latter-day Saint filmmakers can say, well, I can still make a product that is uh, available to all audiences but doesn't have to specifically hit somebody over the head with uh, LDS uh, theology or LDS themes. Right. Perhaps people in, in your age group aren't familiar with a, uh, a, a TV show that was uh, very popular in the 1980s called Battlestar Galactica, the original yeah. series. And what a lot of Latter-day Saints don't know is that the original series was created by a church member. Uh, his name was Glenn A. Larson who's passed away now, but Glenn A. Larson found a number of incredibly uh, ingenious ways to incorporate LDS theology into the scripts of Battlestar Galactica. Right. I remember being a kid, 13, 14 years old, sitting at my, in, in my house watching Battlestar Galactica on TV, and all of a sudden something would come on in the script and we'd all look at each other and say, hey, that's just like right out of our church. <laughs> I didn't know at that time that Glenn, Glenn A. Larson was a member of the church, but he had actually used that material and written in a number of uh, pieces of LDS theology right into the scripts, which was quite interesting. Hmm. So regardless of whether you're LDS uh, or, or any other faith, the number one thing that you need to be successful in the movie industry is just one thing, and that's determination. That is the number one thing. Uh, determination will make up for a lack of talent, and it will make up for a lack of financing. And, you know, if you have determination in spades, you can be successful, but it might take 10 years. Uh, Jim Carrey, famous actor, once said, the people who make it are the people who keep going. And that really is, really is true. That is awesome. Latter-day Saint principles actually end up helping you in, Absolutely. in, the, in the filmmaking industry. Who Absolutely. would have thought that that was a possibility? <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on, Richard. Uh, this has been very enlightening, very insightful, and hopefully uh, beneficial for a lot of our viewers. I know that we have at least, you know, there's like a, a section, that a handful of our viewers that actually are aspiring filmmakers. So uh, I know that this will be beneficial uh, to at least some of them. If nobody else, at least it was beneficial to me. <laughs> but thanks for taking some time out of your day and, and talking to us, and uh, good luck on your next production. Thank you so much for having me, Taylor. It's been a pleasure. Cool. Thank you.